Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wojciech Pazdur, and I'm head of production at the Farm 51. And I wanted to tell you about the project, the quite unique VR project that uh, I'm working on for more than one year so far. So who we are? Uh, the Farm 51 is the video game development company from Poland that started in 2005, and it's responsible for a couple of not very well known games, but all of, of the, all of these games was uh, first person action games, meaning first person uh, experiences led us to the conclusion that we could also try uh, to work on VR experiences, which for us are also first person. Uh, so, uh, in 2013, we started to work on VR content and VR application also outside of the gaming. And as a company, we have been always focused on creating a photorealistic 3D graphics because for, let's say, first person shooter, it was always the best choice, choice and that's what we try to do uh, in VR as well. So, uh, in 2013, we started to work on our internal technology for creating photorealistic 3D content. We call this technology Reality 51. And uh, basically, uh, this technology is a set of processes, know-hows, pipelines, tools, hardware, and software that is related to create photorealistic uh, content with help of first, photogrammetry and other uh, ways of scanning the 3D world, and second, mixing in with the 360 video, 360 photos, and also the regular camera and photo shoots as well. So we have utilized this technology in uh, several VR uh, projects like simulation, education, military training, and medicine as well. And I will just play a beginning of the short trailer. Uh, this pre presentation will be available, so all movie materials that are uh, listed here will be also uh, available to play from YouTube. And right now I just play a short video to, to start explaining what, what we are dealing here with. People have always strived to describe reality. Images, movies, video games, they all try to give a new meaning to reality. They combine the essence of reality itself and our perceptions. Reality 51 is an attempt to give reality a new meaning, or simply something more than reality. But let's start with something simpler. This woman may wish to change something about her. Or everything. We could change all models in the world like that. We could change you. Let's put the model aside and have a look at this building. We can view it from all sides. Get inside. And even make it a part of a dark. Okay, so uh, that's for uh, for now. So we have been trying uh, to, let's say, deal with the methods of uh, recreating the real world into the virtual reality and into the video game engine. Of course, scanning, photogrammetry, this kind of stuff is not something uh, very new, even if we are dealing with this for a few years. But what we have been very strongly pushing into is to how to transform the photogrammetry very heavy amounts of data into the real-time application that can be playable on almost every platform, including the consoles or mobile devices. So, at top of it, we started uh, to work also on the games that are about the virtual reality. We simply created a concept of the game that is uh, telling the story about virtual reality, meaning that, you see, we got some cool 
design. I believe we have much more cooler design of VR helmet than, you know, than any Gear VR or Oculus or, or, or Daydream. Just probably it would never work in the real life. But this is very special devices because it also transforms you to the alternate realities. So it's not just VR device, it's also move you to alternate realities. We simply were so much into the VR subjects that we, we started to work on the game that is related to virtual reality. And uh, in this game, uh, we accessibly used, uh, the, the, that, that project uh, appears before we started to work on Chernobyl VR project. We accessibly used photogrammetry to create the environments, the characters. Uh, basically, the whole game world has been used uh, with help of 3D scanning. So I will just play a short uh, movie showing uh, some environment from Get Even. So what you see here uh, is uh, quite related to the Chernobyl uh, VR project because actually and originally Chernobyl location was supposed to be part of this game. Our initial idea was that we want to make a cool looking photogrammetry based game. So we wanted to scan Chernobyl and put it into this game. But it appeared that the Chernobyl subject is a bit too, too big, too complex to connect the process of scanning Chernobyl with the development on the, the game that was running uh, from 2013. So we had to split these two projects. And even if they look quite similar by the art style we are using, they are actually separate projects because we simply uh, decided that Chernobyl will be much better as the separate project. The location which you see here is a quite cool location based in Poland. It's called the Nuclear Command Center. It's the abandoned uh, anti-nuclear strike shelter that, that was built in the Cold War era to protect the uh, Polish government from the potential nuclear strike from the US. So, uh, so basically, and what you see here is the location uh, based on the mental asylum that you have seen before on the uh, Reality 51 trailer that was scanned in, uh, po in uh, Poznań in Poland added and is also location uh, used for uh, forget even game. And then we have moved to the concept of Chernobyl VR project. So what we wanted to create it was something that would be relatively easy to put into the VR, at least uh, taking, considering our experience uh, in, in photogrammetry in game engine, and something that would be also uh, the R&D project for us, because we saw that VR market is uh, going at very different pace and in very different direction than the video game market. So we have decided that, okay, we try also to experiment with VR and to experiment with technologies for making VR. And Chernobyl was a quite good case because we believed it, it will bring the attention of the people, it will bring attention of everyone who may be enthusiast of VR into, into our project. So basically our idea was that we'll make the virtual trip to restricted zone, meaning you will be able to explore the Chernobyl we will mix the interactive and non-interactive material, and we will use it to try to explore VR as a medium for creating the project outside of the gaming industry. In this case, it was mostly about the educational project with a bit of social uh, value. So we wanted to show something about the past, present, and future of Chernobyl. What you see here on this photo, this photo has been taken today or yesterday there, if we take the uh, European time. I just put it briefly into the uh, presentation because what you see on right, uh, what you see here in front is the uh, reactor four, the one that exploded, that is co covered with the blocks of concrete. And these blocks of concrete are already decaying because they are 30 years old. And it's not easy because of radiation to remove them and to place something else uh, in place of them. So. The construction which you see on the right that is not looking very big here, but is one of the biggest metal construction in the world and uh, definitely the biggest movable construction. It's simply a huge hangar or shelter built uh, out of very special uh, uh, metal structures that is supposed to be moved here 
and cover the old reactor and then the old reactor will be finally demolished and then, then the nuclear waste wastes will be finally processed to, to make this area safe and clean. And this is happening now. In the next two or three weeks, this construction will be moved and we will not see uh, Chernobyl as, as it was before. So this is actually quite breakthrough moment for us to keep working on it because we also want to document this stage of Chernobyl history. But I will tell about uh, this a bit later. So what we wanted to achieve uh, with this project, uh, first maybe I will play a, a bit of a small trailer and then I will move to the explanation. Koniec kwietnia 2016 roku przypada 30. rocznica katastrofy w elektrowni atomowej w Czarnobylu, czyli wydarzenia, które ziściło czarne sny z czasów zimnej wojny. My na tę okazję planujemy przygotować aplikację, którą nazwaliśmy roboczo Czarnobyl VR Project, czyli wirtualną wycieczkę po opuszczonych miejscach Czarnobylu i w Prypeci. Stworzona przez nas aplikacja powstanie przy użyciu rozwijanych w Reality 51 technologii. Mowa tutaj między innymi o technice fotogrametrii oraz filmowaniu kamerą stereoskopową 360 stopni. Zastosowanie tych środków pozwoli nam na odtworzenie z fotorealistyczną dokładnością całej zamkniętej strefy. I liczymy na to, że to będzie jedna z najbardziej niezwykłych aplikacji vr ponieważ będzie to coś w rodzaju filmu dokumentalnego, ale takiego filmu, do którego można wejść, w którym można rozejrzeć się dookoła, którego przebieg będzie można zmienić i dodatkowo natrafić na niespodzianki, które przygotowujemy tam dla naszych odbiorców. W związku z naszym nietypowym celem wyjazdu zostaliśmy zakwalifikowani jako grupa badawcza. Dzięki temu zyskaliśmy możliwość wejścia do wielu zamkniętych i niedostępnych miejsc. Z naszego punktu widzenia najciekawszym miejscem do skanowania była Prypeć, czyli 50-tysięczne miasto, które opustoszało w przeciągu kilkudziesięciu godzin od eksplozji w Czarnobylu. Wiele dni eksploracji i rozmów z przewodnikiem pozwoliły nam spojrzeć na strefę zupełnie inaczej. My dzisiaj znajdujemy się w tym parku z rozbitymi maszynkami, z procedurami. My znajdujemy się, idziemy dzisiaj tam kulturny centrum, idziemy w basen, dla tego, żeby wy mogli pokazać, jak jak wygląda miasto i co wy teraz możecie zobaczyć swoimi oczami. Okay, so. Our idea was to take our technology and pipeline that we are using for recreating the detailed 3D environments and uh, create very high accuracy and believability of the place that is normally very hard to reach. Of course, technically, every one of you could go to the Chernobyl. There are actually uh, tour offices in Europe that are organizing the tours to the Chernobyl. Just these trips are extremely uncomfortable because, first of all, Ukraine is quite a white country. There is a state of war right now in Ukraine. So, first of all, you are coming through plenty of uh, different kind of controls, like military control, passport control, border control. All the time, everybody is checking your passport. Uh, and you need to go through the dosimetry control in the exclusion zone. You need to go uh, through the special check if you, if you got radiated. Uh, and uh, if you enter the zone itself, it's very uncomfortable to be there because you cannot sit anywhere, you cannot eat anything, you cannot drink anything in the zone, and so on and so on. So this, this is not very nice uh, unless you are a very adventurous guy uh, or girl. So we, we believe that it could be cool to create something uh, in VR that is both exotic and quite uh, touchy because this place is uh, eco iconic, so many of us would like to go there, but uh, if we compare it to other exotic places, most of the other exotic places are easier to reach than 
Chernobyl. And then we also wanted to tell the story about this place because, okay, just excursion, just a tour around this place is interesting. You may see nice environment and you may feel it, especially in VR quite immersively, but uh, the story behind this uh, is also very interesting because uh, Chernobyl was uh, catastrophic in Chernobyl uh, by some historians is considered as the moment that ended the communism era because this this catastrophe made so much mess in the Europe, especially in the Eastern Europe, that it has proven that communist system is absolutely unable to deal with its own structures, with its own uh, development. And then slowly in the next few years, everything around the Soviet Union and around the communism systems in Europe slowly collapsed. Of course, there are theories that it was not necessary the true, it was just the accelerator of these processes. But anyway, the catastrophe in Chernobyl is very interesting uh, even in the history and it is also worth to tell about this. And then we wanted also to develop technology and skill for more advanced projects because this project w was and is relatively simple in construction. It's just uh, interesting, we believe it's interesting because of its content, not because of very sophisticated solution we use, for example, for storytelling. And then again, we wanted to learn how to use VR for educational software uh, uh, and social project. So we have been going to uh, Chernobyl many times as to count everything. Uh, I've been three or four times in Chernobyl, but some of people from my crew was there like seven times within last year. And usually every time we spend like one week on site, more or less. Uh, and uh, every time we have been collecting uh, hundreds of thousands of photos for the photo photogrammetry data and long hours of 360 and uh, ordinary camera recording for the mixing the, and the storytelling elements. So we have approached a lot of challenges. First of challenge was access to the zone. As mentioned, it's relatively easy to go to Chernobyl if you just go to Europe, if you find a, a tourist office that organizes the tours, so you can pay them like 500 bucks and they will take you from uh, from Kiev to Chernobyl, which is about 200 kilometers, so it's like three hours of driving from Kiev, capital of Ukraine, to, to Chernobyl, then you can spend here two or three days. Uh, every day you are going inside the zone, but because of the military restriction, you need to leave the zone every day, also to not get radiated too much. So you are spending the nights outside of the zone, then next day you are going to the zone again, and you are visiting interesting places uh, in the zone. So access to the zone uh, is not that complicated if you just want to go here and walk around, but it's uh, complicated if you want to work on something uh, more sophisticated, especially because of the actual situation of Ukraine. As, as you may know, Ukraine is right now in state of war with Russia. Of course, it's unofficial war. Nobody declared the war, but actually all the security protocols are very highly raised. So to make any unusual activities in special zones like Chernobyl, especially Chernobyl power plant zone, you need to set a lot of permissions. Like first, you need to get a permission from the management of the zone, the government agency that, that runs uh, the zone. Second, you need, you need to get a permission from the power plant management because the power plant is not operational, but it still uh, has some installation that needs to be uh, controlled and managed, even if it's not working, even if none of the reactors in Chernobyl power plant is working, there are still people working on the power plant and you need also to deal with them to let you enter uh, the power plant terrain. Then you need the military services that are guiding the whole area and uh, uh, they are uh, making sure that nobody will try to do anything about the nuclear safety there or nuclear danger there. And then you have special services that are very suspicious if you will come there and, and take that you got 360 camera, they don't know what this 360 camera. If you tell them you are doing photogrammetry scanning, they don't know what this photogrammetry scanning. And uh, even if you show them photo, they, they are not aware what is going, especially if you want to 
plan to use drone. So the, this is normal then. Uh, uh, this all organization is not working well together because there is a lot of chaos because of the situation on Ukraine. So even if you've got permission number one, two, and three, then because of permission number four, when you come to the place, you got the phone call that if you enter this area and you will try to fly the drone, then your drone will be shot down, just like this. And, and it happened every time, not just once. Every time my team was, uh, yesterday came to this place, and again it was like, we have all the permission, we have all the papers, we have all the stamps, and we agreed with everyone, but then someone from security services told, no, not today, today you are not flying because of something, they don't need to explain. If you try to fly the drone, then we'll shoot down the drone. So then you need to make a several calls. So the procedure looks like this, that we are stopping car at the entrance to the power plant. Then we are making calls. We got in phone the several contacts, like very important men from Kiev. Then you got very important women from Kiev. And you call them and you say, OK, we are waiting at the entrance of the power plant. And military guys are telling us that, they, that we cannot go in because we got a drone uh, and there is a restriction that today there is a new restriction that you cannot fly in radius of 200 uh, 2000 meters from the power plant so they are telling us uh, to to go off and, and so on so so every time we had to deal with stuff like this finally we got uh, enough contacts in our phones to make everything working but every time there is like few hours of setting things on place because we enter the place itself. And besides of it, there are regular restrictions. You need to go to the dosimetric control every time when you enter the zone. Like you need to check the level of radiation before you enter the zone and after you are leaving the zone. Basically saying uh, it's uh, not very problematic to, uh, to, to enter then and leave the zone because the level of radiation in most of the places are not very dangerous, but this is the issue anyway. Then size of the area which we tried to work on was the issue because uh, the restricted zone is, let's say, the circle with a radius of about uh, 30 kilometers, of course, in, in range of, uh, of the power plant. Power plant, the, the, the exploded reactor is just in the middle, but the 30 kilometers radius encloses the Pripyat city, encloses the Chernobyl village, and it closes a couple of smaller cities that are all around. And to travel around the zone and to work there, it's also kind of problematic because then you got military patrols and, and uh, they are all the time checking if you got permission, if you got passports. They are preventing you from entering the buildings because most of the buildings are in the state of, let's say, decay. And they may maybe not fully collapse, but you can get a brick falling on your head or something like this. So we have been also using the uh, construction site helmets when working there because sometimes it's, it's dangerous to enter some of the buildings. And then to travel around the zone, there's also problem with the roads because the roads are very bumpy. There is a lot of holes. So if you got a car, you need to be very careful to not damage the car because no one will come to help you if you damage your car uh, in the middle of the restricted zone. But the military can. If, if there is the police hour, like 8 p.m. or 10 p.m., I don't remember, then the military came and they will tell you to leave your car and go out of the zone because there is a military hour. So, so that, that, that's the issue, the size of the area is also the problem. The scope of the content we wanted to uh, gather was also, let's say, some problematic because, uh, some, somehow problematic because we wanted to gather enough content to make a good uh, VR experience and interesting virtual trip, but we wanted to not overwork everything because anyway, you know, VR applications today and today uh, VR devices are not very well uh, crafted to, to give you a long experiences. So we have decided that our experience will be between one, two, three hours, not more, because uh, otherwise people would not be uh, probably very uh, interested in, in going from through everything, and we believe that then instead of making something like a big game, we make something like the smaller experience, which is quite big as a four VR experiences, but it's much smaller than any of the games we have been working on. So we had we had to be very cautious what places we are selecting for scanning, for filming, to to make the more interesting places in the, all the area 
uh, recreated in the application, but not to recreate or not to work too much on the things that will be uh, unnecessary. Of course, the question is if it is not worth to capture all the area. Technically, it will be somehow possible to capture almost everything, but if you go to the Chernobyl or to the Pripyat, anyway, you, are, you are not exploring everything. Because if you spend then like three or five days, like on the normal trip, then anyway, guide is taking you to the most interesting places and is showing you the most interesting places because it doesn't make sense to explore every flat in every building in, in city because most of, most of the flats are the same. So it doesn't make sense to explore and for us to recreate every one of them. So we, we had to be careful what we are trying to uh, simply recreate. Then the transport and logistics was the issue because we had to bring a lot of equipment into the area. Uh, among others, because of lack of electricity, we had to bring the uh, gas uh, fuel generators. Uh, we had to, to have a lot of uh, batteries for the cameras, for the drones, for the uh, every, all the equipment for the lightning that we have been using. And that's the issue because uh, there are, if you fly planes, there are limitations about how many batteries you can bring to the plane. So, so we had to, to deal with, uh, every time we are going to Chernobyl, we have to deal with the security control on the airport and divide uh, batteries to, to have everyone taking the proper amount of the batteries that can be brought to the, uh, to the plane because otherwise, we, uh, and a couple of times we had to leave the batteries on the, air, uh, on the airport because the security was cautious, uh, not necessarily right, but if they were cautious that we are bringing too much of the accumulated electricity power into the uh, deck of the aircraft. It can be dangerous, so, so there is no discussion with them. And if we had option to not fly or to leave some of the batteries on the airport, then, then we have been leaving the batteries on the airport. And then lack of electricity is general issue. Also lack of the network range, because it's not even about the internet access, but usually even phones are not working in most of the places in the restricted zone. There are some spots where you can have some signal and reach, but in most of the places you cannot even use the mobile phones, what is also problematic because if you need to contact with the other people from your team, then you need usually to, uh, to set up the appointment in some gathering point because you have no option to call them and say, okay, you are here and we will be here. Legal issues and permission, as I mentioned, that was a lot of uh, a lot of work around about this. And then radioactivity related restriction. It basically uh, there is a lot of misconceptions about this because most of the people and every time I'm going back from the Chernobyl, someone is ask me how much you are, you are getting radiated or maybe you are uh, lighting at the night or maybe something like this. So it's not that bad. Uh, Actually, I was freaking out a bit uh, for the first time when I was going there. So I called my mama because my mom is a nuclear physicist in Poland. She works on the uh, Silesian Technical University. And uh, I called her, so, so tell me the truth. Is it safe to go to Chernobyl or not? And she did the calculation in, in her head. So she tell, it's 30 years after the catastrophe. So if you don't drink the water from the river and if you don't sleep on the ground, then you are safe. And basically, that's, that's, that's the truth. If you are going to the Chernobyl zone, uh, you can spend there a few days without any harm to your health. Just you need to follow some procedures like not eating, not drinking, not sitting, basically to not get dirty. Because radiation is not in the air. Radiation is in the solid substances. So it's also in the dust, in the dirt, into the mud. So the most heavy radioactivity-related issue many people had was that if you get very dirty, like going into the mud, then uh, the detectors are detecting that you, your shoes are radiated or your trousers are radiated, and then you need to remove the dust, and then usually you go through. But at least two times we had some guy who had to left their shoes on the dosimetric controls and walk on the barefoot because, uh, because the shoes was radiated. So that's, that's the issue. And you cannot take anything from the zone outside because everything in the zone and the solid substances are radioactive, actually. And even if you smuggle them through the dosimetric control in the zone, the whole Ukraine is protected by the system of uh, border controls because Ukraine was uh, the nuclear power back in time. 
and on the end of the communist era, there was a lot of, uh, let's say, issues with the people stealing the radioactive materials from Ukraine. So every airport, every border uh, point in, in Ukraine is protected by very sensitive Geiger meters. So if you bring anything out of the zone, you will be stopped on the border and you pay a shitload of money for the uh, processing the nuclear wastes, even if it's a small toy or small gas mask or whatever as people are trying to uh, remove from Chernobyl. But the good thing is that because of it, most of the things in Chernobyl are left intact because the tourists cannot take too much of the souvenirs from this place. So our concept for the application was that we wanted to let people explore the zone like it was the normal trip with the guide to the zone. So you are entering the zone, then the guide is telling you, you can go there, you can go there, you can go there. This is the school, this is the flat, this is the power plant, and then you are traveling there by bus or on feet, depending on the distance, and then you are exploring this place on your feet, then you are going back to the bus, and then they are taking you to the other place. And we wanted to recreate this, but we wanted to make it a bit interested, uh, a bit interactive to make people interested because of course we could show everything with the 3D movies. Like most of the time, you are simply moving from point A to point B, you are looking around, and then you are going to the, another place, then you are looking around and, and the guide is telling you the story. But there are some small spots which is absolutely amazing to be there and it creates a really uh, strange feeling if you go to totally empty flat, to the totally empty room, and you see the leftovers of the people who lived there, and just in one day they were simply evacuated. They left everything as it was, the toys, the furniture, the clothes, uh, everything, because they were promised they will go back there. The, it was just evacuation of Chernobyl looked like they told about 300,000 of people that you need to leave your houses for a few days, because there is some, uh, let's say, situation we need to deal with, then you will go back. And they never go back to, to this place, so they left everything uh, in the place. And to explore this on your own feet, to just take a look on this, it's something absolutely, I would not say amazing, because amazing is uh, related to somehow probably positive. It's rather sad feeling to, to be there, but we wanted to recreate this feeling. and also to make people interested and to let them explore the place, and I will show it in the moment with some examples. We, we are pushing some small challenges and rewards, but not in the gaming, not, not in the very gaming style, like do something, solve some puzzles, do, uh, let's say, make some activities, but rather some very tiny points of focus, like go there and look at this, go there and look at this. You see there's interesting point that you should uh, discover. And then for finding all the interesting clues, the uh, user is uh, rewarded with some extra story information and with the things that he, can, he may be interested to know about the story of the place. So we wanted to create very interesting and believable visuals. I already shown some examples of photogrammetry, so it looks very stunning and and we believe that by realistic, we, we also make the immersive and believable experience. And on top of it, the, for me, especially for me, because I'm from the gaming uh, environment, I'm from, uh, from the game developer background, for me, the beauty of DK was always something tempting because it's like all, the, of, all of the post-apocalyptic games, like all of the science fiction stories that I have been reading when I was a small kid and, and Chernobyl is something uh, like the fantasy scenario that exists in the real world. And this is also something very touchy and we try to recreate this, this mood as well with the application. But then, and this is the breakthrough moment for the whole application because we spent several months going to the place and gathering another bunches of data, then putting it into the engine, then developing the movement, optimization, and so on and so on. And then the more we have been coming to this place, the more we have been realizing that what makes this place touching is not just that because this place is empty and decayed and post-nuclear wasteland, but it, it made it touching because it was all about the story of the peoples that lived there. 
the more we, we have been coming there, the more people we have been meeting on Ukraine and totally t uh, talking with uh, them about the what happened there, the more we realized that this is something much bigger than we expected and much bigger than most of the people know in the world because you may not know but it's about two million of people on Ukraine that are officially uh, stated as the victims of Chernobyl disaster. Absolutely everyone uh, who we met on Ukraine has someone from his family who either died or suffered from some diseases that was likely caused by Chernobyl accident. Of course, there are very different statistics. Some statistics say that there was 200 people died because of the Chernobyl catastrophe. There are other statistics that says that there was 2 million people that died because of the Chernobyl catastrophe. There is no good way of measure how much of the increased level of radioactivity uh, transferred into the amount of different diseases, uh, especially the cancer, but I personally met and I interviewed for the sake of application several people who was after the heart attacks, after the uh, brain strokes and after the leukemia, all in one package taken from the Chernobyl. So we know that for many people over Ukraine, it was something very terrible and uh, something very dramatic. Also, people who has been removed from the area, they lost all they got. They, were, they, they suffered from the trauma of being simply uh, you know, uh, banished from their place of living because they, they, they were banished to, to, they were sent to other cities. Sometimes they got the places to live, sometimes they didn't get the places to live and they have to, uh, and they have to sustain this something. So we wanted to tell story of these people and we recorded several interviews, usually in 360 form with the 360 camera and uh, we use movies and photos uh, to, to show the human aspect and human stories because this application uh, was relatively small in scope and we technically can recreate the 3D model of any human and we can make an animation with mock-up or we can make a facial animation and so on. But it didn't make sense because the cost of making this for this project would be enormously high and we wanted to really show the emotions of the people. So we decided that we'll go into the trick like not creating the interactive experience with speaking or listening to the people, but it will be more like be present with them, like you are sitting with some victim of Chernobyl and she or he is telling you their stories. And we believe it somehow works. And we recorded several people, also some celebrities from Ukraine, also some politicians from Ukraine, because as I said, everyone on Ukraine had something to say about the Chernobyl. And then we have been spreading these story elements inside the whole explorable area, something like the uh, museum. So right now, the, the closest things uh, that could be that we could compare Chernobyl VR project to is kind of virtual museum because you are exploring the area, and anytime you find something interesting, you may hear or watch the movie. Uh, with telling you part of the story. And we just believe it's more cool than regular museum because there is a regular museum of Chernobyl on the Ukraine, but it's boring because you have several objects that was collected from the place of catastrophe and then you have several DVD movies played on the TVs and, and it's not, not very inspiring. We believe that VR museum here may be a bit more inspiring. So we try to mix uh, past and present events uh, in, in the Chernobyl VR project because what we have recorded, what we have recreated in 3D is the current state, uh, the, the present state of the area. But by entering some places, you, you see the stories of how it looks in the past and what happened there usually in 1986. And we believe that but adding this kind of personal stories to the application, we can make people more understand this story and more uh, tell how, how it really was and uh, what, it, uh, what it all meant for the, for the story of, uh, let's say, Europe or of the Ukraine. And then coming to the Ukraine and meeting with many of people that was touched by this uh, catastrophe, we have uh, reached the access to, to the many archive materials, also mater even materials from the secret services of the communism government on the Ukraine. So we have get to know, for example, that before Chernobyl catastrophe, there was 15, 15 accidents in the nuclear power plant in Chernobyl. 
the accident that every one of these accidents could end in the catastrophe, just they somehow managed to control this. But the 16th accident made a big kaboom and then, then it ended how it was. So, so that there was a lot of really crazy stories about what, what was going on on the Chernobyl power plant and part of it is uh, to be experienced in the, in the application we just made. And we wanted to make people related to the story involved so we have been uh, using both interviews with the people. We also asked people to bring us the, their family photos from the era, and we, we collected a lot of materials that, that, that was never shown in any Chernobyl coverage uh, created so far. And then I will switch for a moment to show you how it looks like. This is just a part of the Chernobyl experience, so we got a school here. So as you see, the school here is the part of the explorable environment. It's being recreated with the photogrammetry. So as you may see, probably is the most detailed 3D graphics created so far for, for any VR application. I'm not saying the most beautiful, because it's just, uh, you know, digital copy of the, of the place, but looking at the texture resolution and at the detail of every element you may see here, it's, uh, we, we believe uh, that it is something quite unique for this application. Then every scrap of the paper on the floor is unique. If you look closely, especially if you have, if you have head tracking in the VR, you, you may close your head to some of the documents. If you know Russian, you may even try to read them. So you basically, uh, in the VR, you see the ambient sound, you explore the place exactly as it is uh, looking in the reality, and then you slowly move uh, from one point to the other point. Of course, for different uh, VR platforms, we, we also implemented the teleportation option. We, we generally support different control schemes, and we are still working on the control schemes and the optimization of the application. It's still not finalized, even if it's available in the Oculus Store and Steam as in early access mode. So then we started to add this story elements, for example, like here, you got the, uh, here you got the TV. Of course, the TV, this TV should not be working normally because there is not electricity, but if you approach the TV, you can watch the old propaganda movie from the era showing you the kids from the school and, and then you can have a lector voice explaining you a bit about the the story uh, of the kids that were learning in this school. Then you can try to approach the piano, and then you can watch some other material. Or not. Maybe because of the projector, I got some issue with this. It's basically VR application. Indoctrination of the teachers and cancer the education. An artistic work from early on, as well as the whole school's culture and life coming to place in the leading role of the party and the foundations of the socialist society. The teachers instilled a total fact, submission. Every day various groups held their collectivization of actions. Such classrooms were indispensable in all the republics of the Soviet Union or the countries of the As you can see, there is a stage and a grand piano for the accompaniment. Walk around and learn more about the standard stage in each school in Europe. It's not working well in the split screen mode. So anyway, uh, the guy you have seen there in the middle of the school, he was recorded in one of the rooms which we have also scanned. And uh, this guy, uh, is working on the restricted zone as a guide. So, so he is guiding you and telling you the stories exactly as you saw here. But uh, he was also a worker of the nuclear power plant at the time of catastrophe. So he really knows the, the story. He, he lived in the Pripyat. He is also showing us uh, his flat, the place where he lived back in time. So, so it's, it's one of the interesting people which we have grabbed for, uh, for the narrative part of, the, of our application. And then we also added some of the interesting places because anyway we believe to make people interested in VR we, we need to show something cool. So what you see here is called so-called Moscow Eye. It's the very huge 
uh, metal construction, the installation that was a big uh, intercontinental radar that was supposed to detect the nuclear strike from the US coming to the Russia. So it was on the Ukraine, like the border of the, uh, like the, border of the uh, Soviet Union. And uh, it was built close to the Chernobyl power plant because it uh, consumed an enormous amount of the power. So part of the uh, uh, goal, task of the Chernobyl power plant was to uh, was to use this uh, this construction. It's about two kilometers long and 150 meters tall, as far as I remember. And the interesting thing is that many people, especially tourists, are trying to climb up at the very top of this and make a photo. So a couple of people from our team tried, but none of them uh, managed to, to go to the very top because it's more like one, an, one hour of climbing up, there are still others whenever... Uh, you, you may imagine that it is very dangerous and also very exhausting, so no one from our team gone at the top, but we have scanned this, we have reconstructed this as the 3D model, and in the VR, you can walk over the top of the Moscow Eye, and you can see the panorama of the Chernobyl, and you can even try to jump off the, off the edge, uh, but nothing happens because this is not the video game, so there is no, uh, no brutal effects regarding what you can do here. But most of the people are very scared if, you, if, if they are at the top of a very tall building and this building is, uh, is rusty and it looks like it can fall at any time. So even such a simple experience makes a lot of, uh, makes a lot of uh, fun for the people. And there we mix technologies because we couldn't scan all of these objects. So we recreated this, it by hand as a 3D model. Then we used the 360 spherical uh, photos and movies to, to make the to show the environment around this and most of the people still don't know VR so uh, this is the ultimate showcase to check if some people are very let's say sensitive to VR uh, issues like the heights like the feeling of being on the open space and and so on and then because VR market uh, still doesn't fully exist and we are trying already to sell this application, but as most of the VR application, it sold like a few thousand of copies, so it didn't recoup its cost. Uh, we, we are still bringing it for the next platforms, uh, like Samsung Gear and uh, PlayStation VR, so hopefully we believe we will earn some money on it. But so far, VR market still doesn't exist like the cash bringer, at least for the mass application, so we are trying to get the support everywhere. Like we, we have been in touch with many people, especially on the Ukraine, because it was very sensitive subject, subject for here to, to get the support, uh, to be able to go to the zone for free, to be able to get some people to help us on site. The guy you see here on the photo is Vitaly Klitschko, the, one of the uh, boxing champion, champions of the world, which is actually the mayor of Kiev, the politicians, and his father also, died because of the cancer caused by Chernobyl uh, catastrophe. And uh, then we have recorded Vitaly Klitschko as the one of the narrator in our application. And they also, uh, they brought us a lot of support in, in going to the zone, in delivering us materials and so on. So we, we tried, we, we decided that if we, even if we cannot make this uh, very profitable, we try to make it meaningful and we, try to make it social by supporting the charity. We, we have decided that part of the incomings from the application, no matter how much is it, uh, but, uh, but par percentage uh, part of the incomings from the application comes to the charity that supports the victims of Chernobyl because we believe that uh, we should pay some tribute to the Ukrainian people who helped us in developing this uh, application. It was actually amazing how many people were simply willing to, to go with us to the zone, to, to bring us some materials, to help us with working on something. And of course, we are trying to use the moment of VR hype to bring this application like something uh, noticeable. So, so we uh, made a virtual museum of Chernobyl in Kiev, thanks to, to support, uh, among others, of the Ukrainian officials, we were able to make a VR exhibition for a couple of weeks in Kiev, in the Museum of History, where we were showing uh, the application, the virtual tour of Chernobyl to many people, including like the guy on the photo, the people who was there. And for them, there was also uh, somehow shocking experience to go back to, to this place in VR and and uh, and, ex and show how, how their 
living place looked after 30 years because normally they would not uh, dare to, to go to this place, even if it's not so far away from their location. And then, of course, uh, we had to teach people how to use VR because Ukraine is a poor country. Almost no one has the VR device there or, or the proper proper uh, equipment to play any VR application. Average salary on the Ukraine are like 200 or 300 dollars. So, so uh, mo for most of the people, what we have shown was the first contact with the VR. And soon we will start to make another VR exhibition in Chernobyl this time to, to, to again show the next part of the application to the people. And because some of the people, especially because of the age differences, uh, were not aware how to use VR. We were also preparing special versions of the application with higher or, level or, or lower level of interactivity. Like sometimes it was just 360 movies for the people who, are, who didn't know how to use the controllers. And sometimes it was fully interactive application, especially for younger people who, who wanted something more immersive. So. We have released uh, this application already on Oculus Rift in Vive uh, in early access mode. Early access mode because we still need to work on the technology on optimization, and we are still adding a new content. And Gear VR and PlayStation VR version uh, will be released soon. Uh, we got a huge coverage in worldwide press, mainstream, and technology because this year was 30th anniversary of Chernobyl disaster, so there was quite a lot of. Uh, press and journalists writing about the subject and, and our application was also interesting as a part of the documentary of the place and we got really positive feedback from press and general users like the mainstream users but we got a lot of complaints from gaming based users because gaming based users meaning the people uh, who, who are let's say the gamers who bought VR then they were not very happy about this application because they said there is no challenge, there is no, not much to explore for them because they would like to have like 10 hours of experience, they would like to have challenges, zombies shooting and so on, and we didn't do this. So, uh, so uh, we were very blamed on Steam. Like on the Oculus Store, we, we have a lot of positive reviews, and on the Steam, we had a lot of negative reviews, mostly about the uh, scope of content and also about the technology and quality because we still are fighting with optimization, especially of the 360 movies. Actually, the stereo, uh, photogrammetric content is working very well in VR, but the 360 movies are not because we are playing them through the Unreal Engine, and Unreal Engine still needs to, to uh, let's say, be a bit more enhanced in terms of performance of 360 movies. And we have launched some of the new Ukrainian projects. Uh, uh, because of showing the project on Ukraine, we have been approached by the other social organization so for example we are right now making a VR documentary about the war on Ukraine that will be released probably end of this year or beginning of the next year so that was the positive result of of what we have done already and in the future we plan to release the new platforms we also would like to finally use this great content to make a game like the story story driven game about the Chernobyl probably quite serious not very fantastic quite serious story and what is the uh, interesting first? We need to work fast because Chernobyl is disappearing. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this huge construction shown here soon will cover the Chernobyl reactor. And then there, there, there will be the start of the process of leveling the remaining of the Chernobyl disaster. So part of it will be left for the tourist, very small part, just to make a short excursion for the tourists. But the buildings are already so decayed that it's dangerous to go there, so most of the buildings will be demolished, and there is a huge plan to build a, a solar uh, energy power sources around there because there is still infrastructure with the cables, like the, with the, all the wires to bring electricity to the rest of the countries, just they don't have the power plant there that would be operational. So the plan is to, for today, the plan is to erase the remains of Chernobyl power plant, a nuclear power plant, and build the new renewable power sources there. And then we hope also to visualize this process because it will be a huge, uh, also historical operation that will take probably like 20 or 30 years. So it's also interesting uh, to be part of, of the process and to make it part of our documentary what may happen there because we can also easily visualize the future of Chernobyl in form of VR documentary. And as you say, th these are photos from today. Clock is ticking, so uh, we just have like two weeks before the 
Chernobyl reactor, the one which is on the right side will be covered. So here are the team that is working, as I said, today morning in the zone. As you see, the weather in the Ukraine is not very good. This is also a photo from today. So, so they need to, to work fast because in the next two weeks, we won't be able to record much more materials, especially on the power plant itself, or on this part of the power plant that, that is most interesting from the historical point of view. But there is still, still a lot of beauty to be shown. So we plan for the next year or two be, before everything there will be closed, demolished, disabled for ability to visit, we plan to keep going there and to record more materials for Chernobyl VR project as it is, but also for the game that we would like to make about the Chernobyl uh, or using the Chernobyl as an environment because we believe this whole area is so cool and we already got so, so much material that it would be a waste to not use it for also something that is closer to our previous experiences like, like the uh, games and maybe in this case also virtual reality game. So that's all, and I guess we still got like two or three minutes from question, if you have any. Okay, maybe go to the mic, yes. Hi, uh, one of the biggest challenges with uh, photogrammetry is uh, how dense the meshes are. How do you guys deal with that, uh, processing that and optimizing that for virtual reality? So basically, uh, what I could say, this is the core of our technology. Uh, I mean, the process of optimization. Because photogrammetry scanning is quite straightforward. You need to be very well photographer, and you need to have proper camera equipment. You need to know how to make photos. But basically, if you know, it's quite straightforward. But uh, everything is about transforming this very high density meshes in texture into something that is optimized enough for the real-time engine. And it's still good looking. So. I can just say that it's not like one tool or one element of process. We are using several uh, pieces of software, both the publicly available like Maya, 3D Code, ZBrush, and so on, and some of the custom-made uh, tools to, to make the different stages of optimization because the mesh optimization is one thing, second thing is texture optimization, third thing is uh, make the physical model of the of the environment that we are optimizing and so on. It's quite, uh, right now the process is quite fast. It could be f faster, but we are using special uh, server infrastructure. Some, some, some of the calculations are being done in the cloud, and this is actually the core of our technology, which is not very secret, but we don't have time today to explain everything. But if you are interested, we, we can talk about it later. Um, awesome, awesome work. I actually work for Autodesk, so we pay Thank a lot you. of attention to photogrammetry stuff, so it's super cool uh, to see somebody doing an experience like this all with photogrammetry. Um, I'm interested in whether you guys feel like it takes more time or less time to do it photogrammetrically, or is the photogrammetry a way for you to, to be accurate, or is it a way for you to save time, or how are you looking at it in terms of your workflow? Okay, so it's easy to answer this question. If you have seen the room, like the one of the rooms we have been exploring, if you want to make this kind of room from the scratch, like want artists to make this kind of room because they can do it, it would take them several weeks. Probably one month for such a detailed room with so many different textures and so on. And probably it would not even look as realistic as it is. So for us right now, the process of making uh, this kind of room from the start of fo making photos to the end of putting into the engine is about three, four, five days. So it's about four times faster. Of course, it's not like, okay, so we do everything four times cheaper because you need to organize the tour, you need to have the equipment, you need to use different specialists to do so. So it has some cost. It's still expensive to do this, but from my point of view, if you just know that you can scan something, because there are some limitations, some places that you cannot scan, but if you know that you can scan something, that it's, it's generally more efficient than uh, creating it from the scratch. Um, how are you guys handling lighting? So we have been uh, taking different approach for the sustain lighting. So right now we, we are uh, using the more straightforward uh, approach, like we are simply bringing a lot of a special uh, ambient light sources to, to the place and when making a photo we are just moving them and it's quite quick process because 
you are making photos, moving the camera, making lights, moving, making photos, and so on. So in a way, to scan one room takes lights like one or two hours, which is not very huge amount of time. And with help of lighting and proper setting lighting by hand, simply manually at time of shooting, we have full control over making the texture flat because uh, we tried some, let's say, automatized processes, but there were always cases when it didn't work, so then we go into the brute force of moving the lights, and for now it works as the be best solution, but maybe we will find some other in the future. But then you're using a sunlight in, in Unreal in the game engine afterwards? Yes, basically what you have seen in the engine was the dynamic light by the engine because we want to have a control over the light, so basically the textures are quite flat. Sometimes there are some remains of the lighting, but very unnoticeable. Sometimes we are manually retouching them in the Photoshop, sometimes, but basically we can use any, any kind of light we want. Awesome, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, so thank you very much for your attention.